um, what I'm going to, to do is go into more detail on each of the phases of, um, of, the, um, of the startup life cycle. So I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about the different you know, sub-steps within the search for product market fit, uh, do the same for search for go-to-market fit. Uh, and depending on whether we actually have time, it's possible that I'll have to defer our discussion of aggressive scaling to uh, to our next lecture. Uh, but I should be at least able to to go into detail on search for product market fit and search for go to market fit tonight. Um, so let's go ahead and 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 do that. So and one of the important things in uh, our discussion of these phases of the uh, of the startup life cycle is that I'm going to try to highlight the different sub steps of each phase of the life cycle uh, via example using uh, using real world startups to, to, to illustrate what these phases usually look like. So as I said, first I'll uh, discuss phase one of the startup life cycle, which is a uh, search for product market fit. Um, again, when I say uh, product market fit, I mean resolving product uncertainty and beachhead market uncertainty. So that means, you know, what, what are like the key characteristics of finding or achieving product market fit, right? In essence, you find an important problem, right? Where that involves two things, right? You need to identify a problem that your product or service is going to be solving. And you want to identify a group that cares a lot about that problem, right? So the, you know, the, in the extent of the value proposition that you, uh, offer uh, your specific uh, beachhead market. And once you identify this problem, you need to make sure that, you know, at least early on, you're providing an adequate solution to that problem, right? Uh, in particular, are you, are, are you providing a solution that's good enough that'll get the group that cares a lot about this problem um, to uh, adopt and pay for uh, your solution? And in thinking about the search for product market fit, Oh, I see. So, um, are we are we still on um, part one of my slides, or are we on part two at the moment? I, I just saw Paul Emil's uh, question. Um, still part one, note one. Okay, so something is. Uh, I'll I'll stop sharing and I'll um, I'll reshare because. Uh, on my on my end, I am on the second set of notes, so I'm not really sure why why that's happening. So just give me one second. I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna create a new share, I guess. So I'm gonna stop share and create a new share. So sorry about that, everyone. Uh, can everyone can can everyone see slide two now? Okay, perfect. It's uh, all right. So uh, apologies about uh, about that. I'm still kind of learning how to navigate uh, going across different sets of slides. So I, I know next time I need to when I move to a new set of slides, um, I need to stop my initial share and, and restart for the new set of slides. Um, okay. So, but as as all I was doing so far is describing you know, what, pro like what product market fit means. Um, and of course, as an objective in terms of achieving product market fit, the goal of the startup is to achieve product market fit at low cost and quickly. And just as importantly, you don't want to start trying to scale aggressively until you've achieved product market fit. Um, and so a lot of our description of this phase of the startup life cycle is going to be about thinking about how we can efficiently discover this product and beachhead market combination. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanna provide a couple of quotes that highlight just how important this phase of the startup life cycle is um, and, and how important it is for this phase to be solved before you start moving on to the uh, other phases of the startup uh, life cycle. So, you know, one bit of uh, evidence that supports this claim uh, comes from something called the Startup Genome Project. So Startup Genome Project is a uh, project started in the Bay Area that surveys um, 
a large number of startups to try to understand various aspects of why they succeed, why they fail, uh, and other uh, elements of the startup experience. And um, one of the main findings that the Startup Genome Project has, uh, has uncovered is that the number one reason that startups fail is that they try to scale prematurely. And, and what they specifically mean by that is that startups try to aggressively go to market before they've actually solved this problem, right? The, before they've achieved product market fit. Kind of related to that is a quote by a, a, a very prominent venture, capital, uh, venture capitalist called David Scott. He's probably one of the most famous VC investors in the world for enterprise SaaS, so software as a service companies. Um, he's a general partner at Matrix Partners, which is a, um, one of the more prominent Bay Area slash Boston area uh, VCs. And uh, Scott says entrepreneurs frequently struggle to understand their target customers well enough to know where the pain lies, what to build, how to message and sell, not gaining this understanding causes startups to waste money and frequently to fail. And the basic, right? So the basic idea here is un until you've solved for product market fit, any aggressive attempt to go to market is going to involve wasting resources. And a lot of startups, you know, fail because they, um, uh, you know they they uh, waste resources by trying to basically skip this uh, this phase and go straight to to aggressive go to market. Um, one kind of simple way to think about uh, product market fit is uh, it comes from a quote by Andy Rakleff, who is a prominent entrepreneur slash VC. is one of the founders of Benchmark Capital, which is one of the most successful Bay Area VCs. Um, and Andy Ratcliffe is the person who actually popularized the idea that you need to resolve product market fit uh, before, um, uh, before you kind of go to the uh, other, other phases of the startup life cycle. And he basically just summarizes product market fit in the following way. He says, do the dogs eat the dog food? Right. So like, you know, unless the dogs are willing to eat the dog food, you shouldn't be investing a lot of resources to figure out where the um, dog pounds are at and things like that. Um, so uh, this is generally viewed as the really fundamental first step that startups should be focused on. Um, I'm going to, you know, I like to think about the search for product market fit in the context of uh, this diagram that I'm showing on a slide where I think of um, search for product market fit as first involving various forms of prior analyses. And I'll talk about different forms of prior analyses that we see uh, startup founders use to generate an initial hypothesis on what product and market um, uh, the startup should be tackling. Once you have these hypotheses, and these should be hypotheses both about what your product should look like in the short run, but also what they should, what the product should ideally look like in the long run. And then once you have established these hypotheses, then what you want to do is you want to test those hypotheses by launching a product targeted to specific beachhead market uh, early on. And this initial product is not meant to be a perfect product. It's meant to be a quick and easy, like relatively speaking, a quick and easy product that you can launch to start testing your hypotheses, to start resolving um, you know, some combination of product uncertainty and beachhead market uncertainty. Uh, and this is a very common strategy that startups used and it's called launching an MVP or a minimum viable product. So we'll talk about some aspects, you know, potentially like some surprising aspects of MVPs um, and, uh, and again, I'll highlight these with specific examples. But once you've developed this first version of your product, again, you wanna do this quickly and at low cost because as a startup at this stage, you have limited resources. Um, then you, you know, again, you try to launch it into the market and you, know, you start getting feedback from the market. And then the question is, from this feedback, what are the things you can learn, right? You can either validate that you actually have achieved product market fit, Right, or you find that you're not getting any traction or user satisfaction in your product, in which case you need to start making changes to your product. Sometimes those changes are relatively minor, 
where you're going to just make small iterations or changes to your uh, to your product. And in other cases, right, the feedback is sufficiently negative that you need to kind of re-hit the drawing board and, and make a more substantial pivot uh, of your company. So we're going to talk about these various phases. But before we do this, um, you know, one thing I'll highlight about what I've described here in a in this diagram is this is really just kind of a generic diagram for testing hypotheses or experimentation more generally, right? You start with hypotheses that are ideally are informed by some sort of prior analysis, and then you want to find an efficient way to test these hypotheses to find out if they're right or if they're wrong, right? And the choice of how you design an MVP is really this question of how do you want to try to efficiently and at as low of a cost as possible, test these hypotheses and inform how you need to change the hypotheses if the hypotheses aren't exactly uh, correct. Right, so I'll highlight some of these different uh, sub-steps of the search for product market fit. And I'll do all of this, as I said, um, with, with the use of examples uh, right now. All right, so uh, first thing I'll do is I'll kind of list some of the, uh, some of the common types of prior analyses that startups do um, when they're trying to establish their hypotheses and decide what sort of minimum viable product they're going to um, uh, launch. Um, so you can kind of categorize the main types of prior analyses into, into four buckets. Uh, one is general market research. I'm gonna highlight this one uh, in a fair amount of detail via example shortly. And I'll highlight it in the context of uh, Amazon and the prior research they undertook um, when they were launching. So I'll, I'll discuss this uh, relatively shortly. Uh, another type of market research, uh, sorry, another type of uh, prior analysis that, um, that startup founders often do uh, when they're trying to decide what sort of MVP they, uh, they should design, what sort of target market they should be uh, trying to address first is feedback from experts. Um, a nice example of feedback from experts comes from uh, Square, the start of Square, right? So it's, um, uh, you know, what, did, what did Square initially do? Square initially uh, you know, produced a, a device that allowed you to uh, transform your smartphone into uh, a credit card uh, reader, right? So something that would allow you to accept uh, credit card payments. Um, and so, you know, early on when Square was trying to decide exactly what sort of product they would launch and, and what their target market would be, uh, they needed to try to assess, well, was this kind of technology feasible with the new smartphones uh, that were uh, coming out? So in particular, the original iPhone. And so they got feedback from uh, an expert on credit card technology who was a professor at uh, the University of uh, Washington in St. Louis. And then they also needed to figure out, well, even if they you know, developed a device that would allow a smartphone to basically read in credit card information, they needed to figure out also how to, how to be able to accept payments through the credit card payment system. So they also got uh, feedback from a practitioner on how they, could, um, how they could do that as well. That was something called the merchant aggregator model of, uh, of uh, kind of organizing payments. Uh, what a merchant aggregator model did is that uh, Square basically set up a, um, uh, a, a merchant account with, uh, uh, with, a, with a bank where they could basically uh, receive and make payments uh, in the standard kind of uh, credit card uh, payment uh, system. Uh, and what they did is they allowed all of their Square users to basically make use of their account. So they would take in data on all the transactions received and paid from their various customers, and they would execute all those transactions within, within their merchant account. So they were aggregating all their client um, uh, payment orders uh, through, uh, through their account, and then they just needed to build software to keep track of which, which transactions were coming uh, from where. And that allowed them to basically you know, uh, create uh, software that would accept uh, these payments. But that required an understanding of exactly how uh, the payment system works uh, and stuff like that. 
So feedback from experts, both to kind of figure out, well, how can you at low cost insert yourself within an existing institutional landscape? And also technologically what's feasible is something that startups uh, often have to do uh, early on because in particular, they wanna be able to launch a product as quickly and, and as, at, at, as low cost as possible. Um, there's also another uh, common approach is to seek feedback from potential customers. Um, so this is something called customer development. Um, so I think that's pretty, that's pretty self-explanatory. So I, I won't go over a specific example of that. Um, but I, but one example that that I know relatively well is a is a startup called Front Row Education um, that developed a K through twelve um, um, uh, software on on iPad for for use in uh, in, ele uh, in elementary schools and high schools. Uh, it was founded by uh, one of my ex, uh, one of my ex students. So, if anyone is interested in kind of discussing this specific example, I'm happy to discuss it uh, outside of class. But this is another category of prior analysis that we see used in practice. And the, the fourth kind of most common one is where founders leverage their own experiences uh, or insights, where you know they experience a particular pain point and they basically design a product to solve their problem. And, the process, uh, you know, have, you know establish a, a solution that, that that they can market to other people who experience similar uh, similar problems that they do. Um, so these are kind of four types of uh, market research. Uh, sorry, four types of uh, prior analyses. Um, and so, what do you, what do startups generally do after they ha they've undertaken these prior analyses to try to get a sense of what can I build, who should I try to sell to? Um, you know, I think it's useful to, to first start by saying what you don't try to do next. So what you don't try to do next is off of that prior analysis, build the perf like a perfect product that's completely scalable uh, um, initially. And you, know, you can think of this as being like a big bang approach to a product launch. And the reason for this is, you know, comes from a, a couple of reasons. So one is, and if you wanted to build a perfect product and launch it at scale, that would take a lot, a lot, a lot of time and would be extremely expensive. And to the extent that any element of your hypotheses uh, would be incorrect, um, that would inevitably lead to failure and, and the wasting of resources. Um, I mentioned this big bang approach because a lot of mature companies historically have taken a big bang approach when they uh, launch a product. Uh, and the reason for that is there tends to be much less uncertainty um, in the projects that, that uh, more mature companies undertake. But in light of the fact that startups undertake projects that have a, you know, a tremendous amount of uncertainty, uh, this type of approach is potentially very uh, wasteful on resources. So instead, uh, what I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, what startups do is they try to develop a, a minimum viable product, which is the easiest and quickest product that they can launch, not necessarily to make money or to earn profits immediately, but to generate information and material evidence on whether they actually have a product and target market where we've got product market fit, right? So the goal of an MVP is not to make necessarily to make money immediately. It's to learn whether you're ready to start tackling phase two of the startup life cycle, right? Do you have product market fit? And can you start thinking about uh, how you should tackle your go-to-market strategy? And there's a few kind of surprise, potentially surprising uh, features associated with MVPs. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they're highly imperfect, right? Because you don't have the resources um, and, and sufficient amount of information to be able to kind of build uh, a perfect product. Right, and so you know, within the context of say a, a software startup, right, the you know software is often buggy. Uh, if you've got an e-commerce startup, it's usually going to be uh, supported by a flimsy you know backend infrastructure and operations, right? So MVPs are not perfect products. Um, other things that are a bit surprising about MVPs is that they target a narrow subset of the market of interest. So generally you envision a large market that you're trying to tackle in the long term, but early on you, um, you target a subset of the market. Sometimes actually you 
you know, target a different market altogether. Um, anyway, this narrow market is called a beachhead market. So we'll talk a little bit about the choice of beachhead market uh, via example shortly as well. Um, but something that might be uh, particularly surprising is that sometimes MVPs are not even commercial products. And so I'll highlight two examples of startups that were very prominent or that are you know, very prominent um, that started with MVPs that were not actually uh, commercial products that they could uh, monet that they could immediately monetize from. Um, now, you know, oftentimes people uh, uh, focus on MVPs as being imperfect products. But another thing that's important to remember with an MVP is that even if an MVP is imperfect in many dimensions, if you want to have any possibility of success in generating product market fit, it has to be that the MVP is exceptional in some dimension, right? So if you think of a product as consisting of multiple dimensions, you want to ask yourself, well, which dimensions is it important for the product to excel at, right? To offer an actual value proposition to the, to the beachhead market and which dimensions of product are less essential so that you don't need to perfect those dimensions yet. So generally when you launch an MVP, you have a fair amount of clarity on what you think you need to perfect versus what you think you don't need to perfect, at least in the short run. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna discuss um, this question of um, uh, res like the prior analysis that, uh, that a startup might undertake and uh, a startup's choice of uh, an MVP. So right, right, what minimum viable product to initially build. Uh, and so, as I said, I'll mention a few examples here, and there's going to be an, um, some important takeaways in each of the examples. 